Namaskar and welcome back to this series of lectures on the principles of construction management. And in this lecture, I thought that after completing most of the discussion in the different modules ranging from safety to quality to construction economics, maybe it is a good idea to cover the aspects relating to quality control of a concrete SIVA pipeline to comprehensively cover a particular project itself from the point of view of quality control. You would recall that we had talked about quality control in terms of materials, components and systems. So, what this example tells us or how we go about as far as this example is concerned is to look at a concrete SIVA pipeline as a system and try to see how the quality control exercise actually boils down to controlling different aspects, materials, the components and the installation of those components when it comes to the final system. So, as far as the construction quality control is concerned in construction activities a common consistent and comprehensive framework for controlling quality through testing and inspection needs to be provided. So, the testing covers the types of tests to be carried out and their frequency. So, there has to be a very clear protocol on that and inspection covers procedure, timing and elements of inspection and is applicable to the different stages of the construction work. That is input materials and equipment components, in process activities, interfaces that need special attention and at final completion. So, at different phases we need to have special attention being paid to quality control because it really does not make sense to have excellent components, but execution if it involves assembly of those components, that workmanship if it is poor, then the overall quality control or the overall quality of the system is compromised. So, to that extent, the quality of the project is governed indeed by the so called weakest link. So, we have to identify which is the weakest link in a system and try to pay a special attention to the quality in that part. So, as far as the discussion today is concerned, we will talk about quality related aspects in the construction of a concrete pipe, SIVA pipeline. So, this picture here shows us a concrete pipe, SIVA pipeline being laid. So, now if we can look at this from the point of view of quality control, that at the end of it, we want this pipeline to meet certain standards. This pipeline should perform satisfactorily. Then, what are the issues that are involved? This pipeline is being shown as a buried pipeline, which means that from the level ground, some excavation has to be done as is shown here. So, this is the pit or trench which has been excavated to lay these two pipes. So, there is a, a buried pipeline, which means there is excavation involved. Then there are these pipes which are involved and these pipes are factory made transported to site and assembled here. So, when you look at the assembly, if you look at these joints more carefully, if you look at any of these joints, you will find that the shape of the pipe is something like this and the pipes actually fit into each other in this manner. And the issue really comes as to how to complete this joint. How is this joint to be done? There are different technologies which are available and we need to evaluate those technologies. As far as our example today is concerned, we will talk about sealing these joints with a rubber gasket, but there are other methods available. Now, apart from this, the alignment of the pipes, it is also the vertical alignment that is each of these pipes has to have a certain slope. If a slope is prescribed or given that it is 1 in 100 or 1 in 50 or whatever it is, then the pipes have to be in that slope which means that in order for the pipes to be in the right kind of slope, the finishing at the bottom has to be very good. So, that is we have to level the bottom as far as the trench is concerned. So, the quality of the final pipeline or the performance of the final pipeline would also depend on the 
performance or the finishing of the bottom, the how the pipes are resting on the bottom. So, if we have a soil which is loose here and on that we put a pipe, over a period of time it is likely that the pipe will sink. And if this happens differentially over the length of the pipeline, the pipeline will cease performing. So, these are the kind of things that need to be borne in mind when we are writing the specifications to lay the pipeline and the contractors are executing the project. So, now moving forward, precast concrete pipes either reinforced or unreinforced of both pressure and non pressure types are used in water mains, sewers, culverts, and irrigation works. So, if you look at the cross section of a pipe, basically what is seen is that there is a pipe with a certain thickness. So, this is what is called the thickness of the pipe, this is the diameter of the pipe and this pipe has reinforcement running longitudinally as well as spirally. So, we will talk about all these details as we go along in this discussion today. So, the discussion today can be divided into quality related issues at the manufacturing plant carriage and installation. Carriage includes the transportation of the pipes from the manufacturing plant to the site of installation where the pipeline is being laid and installation itself refers to the fact of assembling those pipes, the joints, putting the pipes in the right position and so on including backfilling. We must remember that if we have a trench and we put a pipe here, finally this is space has to be backfilled and this backfilling has also to have a certain amount of compaction, it should be done in a certain manner so that there is no differential settlements and so on which will cause problems as far as the pipe is concerned. So, we can see almost right now that if we are doing the backfilling, the backfilling will be difficult to do in this portion because the earth here, the earth here has to be pushed below the pipe surface in order to ensure that this pocket is actually properly compacted. So, these are some small small details which we have to work out and make sure that the quality is properly ensured. As far as the structural integrity of the pipes is concerned, one may assume that it is a given specification that both unreinforced and reinforced concrete non pressure pipes should be capable of resisting an internal pressure of at least 0.07. MPA. So, these are the kind of specifications which will be given from the point of view of design. Now, coming to quality control at the manufacturing plant, all the material related to testing procedures, for example, compliance of cement, aggregates and other constituents like chemical admixtures or pozolons are applicable in the case of manufacture of concrete sewer pipes. As far as control of material and equipment is concerned, the requirements related to the materials and equipment at plant include departmental inspection and testing of materials, equipment calibration and efficiency. We are trying to make or manufacture the concrete pipes. There is a raw material in terms of concrete and there is equipment in terms of mixers, pumps and so on. So, the mixers, pumps have all to be calibrated and make sure that they are properly functioning and then there is of course, the quality control of the material itself, the cement, the aggregates, reinforcement and the fact that whether they are meeting certain requirements or not depending on the diameter or the thickness of the pipes involved as we shall see. Continuing with our discussion on the quality control aspects of the manufacturing plant, these issues will relate to concrete reinforcement both longitudinal and spiral and cover, dimensional checks and tolerances, rubber gaskets, joint testing and checking, strength both for concrete and the pipes and other requirements related to surface defects, cracks, covers, lift holes and so on. So, these are some of the checklist kind of points which we need to make and ensure that all of them are appropriately ticked as we move forward in construction of the pipeline. So, as far as the requirements of materials to be used in sewer pipes is concerned and that is coming from standard manufacturing procedures, if the sulphates are predominant in the soil and there is going to be a buried sewer pipeline sulphate resisting cement should be used, site blending of Portland cement with fly ash may be allowed provided the replacement levels do not exceed 25 percent, aggregates conforming to IS 383 or any other specification that you may feel like with a maximum size not exceeding one third the thickness of the pipe or 20 mm whichever is smaller for pipes above 250 millimeters internal diameter 
whereas for pipes of internal diameter 80 to 250 mm the size of aggregate should not exceed 10 mm. So, these are the kind of specifications which are already laid down. So, what one has to ensure is that they are appropriately complied with. We have to have a proper sieve size analysis being carried out at different points in time to ensure that the aggregates that is coming into the plant where the pipes are being manufactured that aggregate meets these kind of requirements. As far as concrete quality is concerned, it should be let us say as per IS 456 2000 with the very severe class. You will recall or you could not find out that IS 456 2000 gives different classifications as far as the concrete environment is concerned and what we are saying here is that the concrete to be used in the sewer pipeline should conform to the specifications or the requirements of the very severe class. For non-pressure pipes, sewer pipes, if mortar is used, it should be ensured that 28 day compressive strength is at least 35 MPa and the minimum cement content is 450 kgs per cubic meter. So, these are some of the requirements as far as the materials is concerned. So, material alone of course cannot ensure the quality of the pipeline project, but that is the first step. As far as the reinforcement is concerned to be used in sewer pipes, again it is coming from standard manufacturing procedures. The reinforcement used in the manufacture of pipe is to be mild steel or medium tensile steel conforming to IS 432 or any other similar specification. Wire fabric conforming to IS 1566 may also be used provided they are suitably designed and in order to minimize the damage due to handling, spiral reinforcement should be closely spaced at the ends of the pipes. The spacing of such end spirals should not exceed the minimum of 50 mm or half the usual pitch of the spiral reinforcement as per design. And the manufacturer should provide a certificate to the purchaser indicating the quality, quantity and dispersion of steel. So, this is a very important and a very interesting requirement that the manufacturer of the pipes needs to certify and give to the purchaser of the pipes which could be to the contractor who could be actually doing the execution of the pipeline work indicating the quality, quantity and the dispersion of steel within the different pipes. As far as cover requirements are concerned, it should be ensured that a minimum of 8 mm clear cover is provided for a pipe having a wall thickness less than 75 mm. However, for pipes having a wall thickness more than 75 mm, the minimum clear cover to be provided is 15 mm and at the ends of spigot steps, the minimum clear cover to the reinforcement should be 5 mm. Spacers used for the purpose of holding the reinforcement in position and providing uniform cover should be absolutely rust proof. Cores indicating reinforcement steel having less than the minimum cover should be the cause for rejection of pipes. So, basically what we are saying is that there are specifications, there are requirements that the cover should be maintained to the extent that is mentioned and required and in order to determine the cover finally some cores can be taken and if those cores indicate that the reinforcement is not placed in position as was required, the cover is not being met, then the pipe lot has to be rejected. Now, the details of such rejection procedures and so on obviously will be given in certain standards and we are not getting involved with that in this discussion. Now, let us come to the requirement of joints. So, this picture here shows how these joints are made. So, there is a groove here where the rubber gasket will sit. So, as far as concrete joints with a groove or offset on the spigot and or the bell utilize a rubber gasket which fits against the shoulder in the groove of the joint. The joint should be soil tight, water tight and should have the ability to accommodate lateral and longitudinal movement. So, these joints, so this rubber gasket should be such that neighboring pipes which it is joining or helping seal between that joint should be such that it allows some amount of lateral longitudinal movement. Now, if in order to make this joint a good joint or an acceptable joint, we need to obviously have rubber gasket requirements. What kind of a rubber gasket to be used? For that, let us say there are specifications which would say something like this. They should be of a solid circular cross section and should be molded to the specified size within a diametrical tolerance of 1 64th of an inch or 1 and a half percent of the diameter whichever is larger. 
these rubber gaskets which are being shown are solid cross section are solid in cross section and are like a ring. So, that ring is actually mounted on to the pipes and this ring is actually mounted on to these pipes and is fixed as is shown in this picture. Now, continuing with rubber gasket requirements, all rubber gaskets should be oil resistant and have sufficient hardness. If there is any need of using a lubricant in fitting the gasket, it should be ensured that the lubricant composition does not impose a detrimental effect on the performance of the gasket in the joint over a long period of time. We must remember that such facilities or installations such as a concrete sewer pipeline would be in position for 20 years, 30 years, maybe even more. So, the rubber gaskets and their performance cannot be allowed to deteriorate very quickly. So, for that we need to have a separate set of tests being carried out and the gaskets used and the lubricants used, even the smallest amount of material being used of any kind should have the right kind of durability. During fitting, the shelf life and the usable range of temperature for using the lubricant should also not be lost sight of. What it means is that the rubber and the lubricant, these are material, they often have a certain shelf life. That is, if they are not used within let us say 3 months or 6 months or whatever that number is, then their performance cannot be guaranteed. We have to make sure that they are used within their shelf life. Also, there is an issue of temperature. So, the rubber and the lubricant which is good for a range of temperature let us say 20 to 35 degrees centigrade may not work effectively if it comes to a temperature which is around freezing or extremely hot. And that is why we must keep in mind, we must make sure that we know what is the usable range of temperature and what is the shelf life of the components such as the rubber gasket or the lubricants which we are using. To that extent, the ready made concrete pipe has a much, much longer shelf life. If the average volume of the gasket after fitting is less than 75 percent of the volume of the annular space in which the gasket is to be contained with the engaged joint at normal joint closure, the gasket should not be stretched more than 20 percent of its unstretched length or not more than 30 percent of the design volume of the gasket is more than 75 percent of the annular space. So, this is something which you will appreciate only if you draw the diagram once again, the detail of how the gasket is to be fitted into the annular space, then you will have an appreciation of the provision being given here. Now, let us take a look at some pictures for dimension tolerances. Internal diameter and thickness of pipe as far as both ends of pipes are checked for internal diameter and wall thickness. It is important that the pipes meet the requirements for internal diameter and wall thickness for the simple reason that only then we can ensure that the pipes will be able to fit in each other the way we had shown it. As far as the actual tolerances are concerned, it is given in this table here for up to and including 300 mm of internal dimensions, the tolerance from 300 mm to 600 mm, the dimension tolerances could be 5 mm and if it is over 600, the dimensional tolerance could be 10 mm. What happens is that if depending on this dimensional tolerance, the joint space between the outer wall of the pipe that is coming like this and the inner wall of the pipe which is coming on top, this space here becomes critical. So, if this dimensional tolerance is not met, then we will have problems in the joint. That is why it is very important to maintain the right kind of quality control and the right kind of dimension tolerances as far as pipes is concerned. The allowable tolerances and the thickness of the pipes ranges from plus 2 mm to minus 1 mm and however, for pipes of larger thicknesses, tolerances may be higher. So, uh, we are not getting into, I am not particularly insisting on a particular tolerance as far as this discussion today is concerned. What I am only trying to flag repeatedly is the importance of having tolerances for each and every dimension that we are looking at. As far as strength requirements are concerned, depending on the internal dimensions, wall thickness and the reinforcement provided, there are criteria regarding the minimum strength of the pipes to be determined using an appropriate test method. And this is one of the methods which is shown here. The pipes are tested in a machine so designed that a crushing force is applied on the vertical plane 
through the diameter and extending through the length of the pipe. So basically what we are seeing here is a compressive force being applied on the pipe in this manner running through the diameter of the pipe. A 0.25 mm crack load is the maximum load applied to the pipe before a crack having a width of 0.25 mm measured at close intervals occurs throughout a length of 300 mm. As we continue to apply load the way it is shown here, we will find that cracks will develop on the surface of this pipe and that is what we have to keep monitoring and the standard is that those cracks should have a width of 0.25 mm. If we get 0.25 mm cracks for a length of 300 mm, then that is the load where we stop and say that well that becomes our strength of the pipe. So, the strength of the pipe is not to failure, but to the extent of causing the onset or creation of crack widths of 0.25 millimeters. Other workmanship considerations could be improper finish, surface cracks, improper consolidation of concrete, end damages and exposed steel. These are some of the bad qualities in terms of finished pipes is concerned. Surface cracks, poor quality of the surface arising from improper consolidation and damages the way it is shown here and exposed steel which is shown here. So moving forward to other considerations, pipes should be free from cracks and bug holes. They should be free from local dents or bulges greater than 3 millimeters depth. They should be straight throughout their length which is actually ensured by carrying out a straightness test. For pipes of all diameters, the deviations should not exceed 3 millimeters for every meter run. They should be impermeable. Permeability tests as described in IS 3597 should be carried out to ensure the permeability and the outside and inside surface of the pipe should be sufficiently hard and they should be free from defects resulting from imperfect grading of aggregate mixing or molding. So we have tests like the straightness test or the permeability test also described to ensure that the pipe meets the requirements. Then we have issues relating to carriage of sewer pipes, how the sewer pipes are handled while they are being transported or while they are being assembled. So this picture here shows the right kind of handling of the pipes in terms of the balance, the support on the barrel and these two pictures are the no-nos. That is we do, should not drag the pipe, we should not support it on the bell. So the pipe should be handled in a manner intended to prevent damage to the ends. They should not be skidded or rolled against adjacent pipes and when using a fork apparatus to lift the pipe, the inner surface of pipe should be scratched to facilitate a better holding during lifting. When it comes to transportation, loading on dry area, improper lift holes, proper stacking of pipes and proper lift holes. These are some of the other issues which are important when it comes to understanding and ensuring a proper quality control during the carriage of the sewer pipes. Now we come to issues relating to installation. We have already talked of the fact that these pipes are laid in a trench which has been either executed like this or it has been executed like this which would depend on the depth of excavation, the soil conditions and so on. So the excavated trench should be of sufficient width to achieve the specified backfill compaction and to a depth 15 centimeters below the bottom of the pipe to provide for granular cushion material. So we cannot have the pipe resting directly on the earth. So usually there is an earth layer that is where we stop our excavation and then we put a granular cushion on which the pipe rests. So when it comes to ensuring the proper levels, then we have to make sure that the granular cushion top has the right slope so that the pipe rests on it properly. As far as the dimension of the trench to be used is concerned, the dimension should be such that after the pipe has been laid, the back filling can be carried out properly and in a manner that the right kind of compaction can be achieved. So we can imagine that if this thickness here or this available thickness here is very, very small, then it is virtually impossible to ensure a proper backfill of the backfilled material. Continuing 
to the discussion on backfilling. The method of backfilling to be used varies with the width of the trench, the character of the material excavated, the method of excavation and the degree of compaction required. The trench should be backfilled to the bottom of the pipe with uncompacted granular cushion material and after the pipe is placed in the trench to the correct grade and alignment, additional haunch support backfill material should be compacted. Continuing, the trench should be filled with hard material in stages. The pipe backfill material should have a maximum particle size not exceeding 20 mm and should be graded accordingly and the backfill material placed above the 0.37 outside diameter level should be compacted or uncompacted to the requirements of the design. This is the 0.37 outer diameter level that we are talking about as far as this provision is concerned. We can obviously imagine that the entire pipeline cannot be laid in a day, which means that the pipe laying exercise will have to be stopped at different points in time and resumed at a different day. So whenever the pipe laying is stopped, the open end of the pipe should be closed with an end board closely fitting the end of the pipe to keep the sand and earth out of the pipe. We do not want material from the trench getting into the pipe while the construction is going on because finally it has to be flushed out. The end board should have several small holes near the bottom of the pipe to permit water to enter the pipe and prevent flotation in the event of flooding of the trench. The pipe should have a minimum laying length of approximately 2.5 meters. However, the laying length should not exceed 5 meters. A depression should be left at the bedding of the joint to prevent contamination of the rubber gasket. After the gasket is compressed and before the pipe is set for function, each gasket should be carefully checked for a proper position around the full circumference of the joint. Gauges should be used to check the final position of the gasket. So as far as the gasket is concerned, we have the gasket placed here and this should be actually running throughout the circumference of the pipe. So that is the first requirement. The second requirement is that it should be at its proper place and this can be checked by inserting a gauge and we know how much is the depth of this gauge and we can check the position of the rubber gasket by inserting a gauge from here and finding this depth with respect to the end of the spigot end. So pipes with lifting holes should be installed such that the lifting holes are at the crown of the pipe. All lifting holes should be properly grouted with cement mortar immediately after the pipe is installed and prior to commencement of backfilling. So if there are holes to lift the pipe, then we must make sure that the holes are at the crown that is at the top and they are properly grouted using cement mortar before we start the backfilling operations. Now we come to the testing of the pipeline as a system. The sievers should be tested and inspected for water tightness to prevent infiltration and exfiltration and to ensure the pipes are laid correctly according to the design straightness and grade. The testing of sievers before backfill will facilitate the replacement of any identified faulty pipes and joints and the testing of sievers after backfill will reveal the leakages caused by the displacement of joints and subsequent damage. So we have to make a decision whether the sievers should be tested before or after the backfill. All non-pressure pipelines should be given a preliminary air test when the pipeline is bedded and jointed before backfilling and a final water test after backfilling. Typically non-pressure pipelines are tested in sections between manholes. As far as the preliminary air test is concerned, this is the procedure which has been prescribed or which can be appropriately modified if you so want. After laying and joining the pipes to the required length, air should be pumped into the pipe gradually until a pressure of 100 mm equivalent head of water is accumulated and stabilized in the system. For better quality pipelines, the internal pressure should not fall below 75 millimeters after an elapsed period of 5 minutes from the start of pumping air. So basically what is being said is that here is a pipeline which will be closed and obviously this material, there are joints here, all this has a certain amount of porosity. So if we pressurize this system to a pressure P, over a period of time, this pressure will fall. So now what is being said is that within this 5 minute period which is being talked of here, the drop in pressure should not be 
more than a certain number. Now, what that number is, whether this should be 5 minutes or 10 minutes, what should be the allowed drop in pressure, that is something which one can decide depending upon the criticality of the pipelines, the nature of the pipeline and so on and so forth. Now, coming to the final water test, all branches and open ends should be closed with suitable stoppers, secured with longitudinal braces before the testing commences. An internal pressure equivalent to the head of water of depth to invert of the pipeline plus 1.25 meters or 4 meters head, whichever is greater, should be maintained for 30 minutes to allow for initial absorption of water. After that, the test pressure should be maintained for 60 minutes and water added must be measured. The pipeline should be treated as passed if the consumption in 60 minutes does not exceed 7.5 liters per meter of diameter per 30 meter of length of the pipeline under test. So, what is being said is that if we have a pipeline which is something like this, we push in some water here, some of it will get absorbed initially as far as the walls of this pipes are concerned. Now, after that absorption has been completed, which is being completed let us say in 30 minutes. We now continue the test by pushing in more water which is required over a period of 60 minutes which is mentioned here and the amount of water consumed should not exceed this kind of a specification. So, the numbers are not important, the methodology or the physics of the test is very important that we fill the pipeline with water, allow the water to be absorbed to the extent that it can or it will be absorbed by the pipe, the joints and so on and then more than a certain amount of water should not be consumed. As far as the infiltration test is concerned, after completing the backfilling and restoration of normal subsoil conditions, all gravity pipelines and manholes should be examined for infiltration as follows. All inlets to the system should be closed to prevent entrance of water. Pumping of groundwater should be discontinued for at least 3 days prior to the test for infiltration and the section of the pipeline under test including manholes should be accepted as satisfactory if the infiltration does not exceed 1 liter per hour per meter of the pipeline per meter of nominal internal diameter. So, infiltration is basically the kind of water coming into the pipes from outside. And here is the requirement which could be 1 liter or whatever number you may decide, but the procedure is as indicated here. As far as sewer protection is concerned, there are conditions where you would require that. The sulfuric acid deposited at the crown of the sewer reacts with concrete and forms calcium sulfate and this results in the unevenness and thinning of the crown. This phenomenon is known as crown corrosion as far as pipelines are concerned. A sacrificial lining of 25 to 50 millimeters is usually provided as a corrective means. Otherwise, protective lining made up of sulfate resisting cement or high alumina cement is provided and periodic flushing of sewers needs to be carried out. So, with this slide, we come to an end of the discussion for today when we went through the entire set of steps which could be involved in the quality control of a quality concrete sewer pipeline. We started with the manufacturing of pipes, the materials inspection and their compliance requirements. We talked of the pipes as components, their requirements in terms of strength, permeability, straightness and so on. And then we talked about various issues relating to the installation or the actual construction of the pipeline which involved making the trench, making the bottom of the trench, laying the granular material, putting the pipe to proper grade and finish and then testing the pipeline as such initially with air and then with water. So, here is a set of references which you may find useful to understand the subject a little better. Now, I now look forward to seeing you at the next class which will be the last class as far as this set of lectures is concerned. Thank you.